want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun, the trust, the magic. Welcome to episode 81 of Reliving the War and welcome to the 28th of April 1997. Brutal times guys, absolutely brutal times. Not only has the house move been delayed again due to documents, title deeds and all sorts of nonsense not arriving on time, but my internet got cut off because, well, I thought I wouldn't need it at my old address anymore. Plus, I've been sick as a pig these past few days. I overdone it on Sean's fanny pack last week it seems. It's been tough. This episode of Reliving the War was edited on a crappy laptop. It took a full week to get this one video completed. Keep in mind that everything else on the channel was already put together and uploaded before I packed up the PC. So yeah, the weekly Reliving the War streak continues through hardships that you wouldn't believe. Honestly though, Reliving the War keeps me busy while I sit around waiting for updates so it's all good. There's no other new stuff on the channel, it's all content I made weeks ago and scheduled. So through the miracle of mobile phone hotspots and a lot of piracy, here is the most cobbled together episode of Reliving the War in the history of the series. Raw is live tonight from Omaha, Nebraska while Nitro is live from the Norfolk Scope in Virginia. Nitro's only 60 minutes tonight due to the NBA playoffs and this continues for a few weeks. So we'll check out the first hour of Raw first and then we'll do our head to head segments afterwards. Raw kicks off with a big Steve Austin vs Bret Hart recap. We get to see everything that happened last week and the WWF were absolutely right to show this all again. It was a great night in the Bret vs Austin rivalry. It all ended with Bret Hart in hospital and Steve Austin getting attacked by Brian Pillman and this week's episode of Raw kicks off with a Brian Pillman promo. Pillman comes down to the ring and he says everyone may think he's crazy but there's actually a sensitive side to Brian Pillman. Pillman says he's deeply religious and after what happened at the end of Raw last week, the loose cannon says he's had a lot of sleepless nights. He isn't sure if he done the right thing. A glorious awakening then overcame Brian. He got overwhelmed by the spirit of truth and he's been praying for his and others misgivings. Pillman wants the fans to pray with him tonight on Raw and this gets a whole lot of booze inside the arena, but Brian continues on. Pillman prays for Bret Hart's speedy recovery, he prays for the fans at Raw who enjoyed the brutality of last week's show, and he prays for everyone across America who gets a kick out of violence. Brian drops to one knee and he prays for the destruction of Stone Cold Steve Austin tonight and he asks fans to open their hearts and let the saviour of the WWF in that saviour being none other than Bret the Hitman Hart. Steve Austin interrupts Brian and Austin says Brian better pray that Stone Cold doesn't come down to the ring and whip Pillman's ass. Pillman says in the good book it's written that it's an eye for an eye and people should turn the other cheek and this leads to Brian pointing his ass in Austin's general direction. Good stuff by the way. And then Stone Cold comes to the ring and he manages to dodge a Hart Foundation ambush. Austin escapes through the crowd and Pillman continues his service by asking Owen and Bulldog to join him in prayer. Bulldog and Owen pray for Brett while Stone Cold is seen backstage grabbing a weapon. Austin comes back out and he chases the Heart Foundation out of the ring. Gonna be honest here, I love Brian Pillman, but this promo and this reintroduction to Brian didn't play up to his strong points at all. The most simple thing to do here would have been the best thing to do. Let Brian go out, talk about his history with Austin, talk about the ankle injury, talk about Austin breaking into his home and why Brian has aligned himself with Brett. This would have been so much better in my opinion but the WWF tried too hard here and I just think this could have been better. We now just assume that Brian's part of the Hart Foundation even though he wasn't formally introduced as a member. Austin ends the promo by saying Pillman better give his soul to the Lord because his ass belongs to Stone Cold. Before our first Raw match we see Pillman praying backstage. 
He wants Bret Hart to arrive safely to the arena and get no further injuries tonight. Flash Funk took on Rockabilly next and Rockabilly took a loss after he ran into the honky tonk man who was stood on the apron. I like how Rockabilly gave his legs to Flash Funk after the Hurricane Rana for the pin. Flash Funk ends up getting whacked with the honky tonk man's guitar afterwards. And normally I'd give things like this a chance and let it play out for a few weeks but I already want the rockabilly stuff to just go away, it's painful to watch. During the match, Bret Hart was seen in an ambulance backstage, I guess the hitman now travels via ambulance. And Bret then gets out and he says he wants to address the audience tonight on Raw. After a commercial break, Vince McMahon announces that Bret Hart underwent successful knee surgery on Wednesday in Calgary. We see footage of that surgery, and then Bret Hart comes out in a wheelchair along with Davey Boy Smith and Owen Hart. Bret says he appreciates Bran praying for him earlier on, but every once in a while, a dirty slimy hyena will break through and the hyena will make a kill on the lion. Austin being the hyena and Bret being the lion. Brett says Austin didn't kill him, the hitman is only wounded, but Brett also realised he wasn't fighting just one hyena last week, he was fighting a whole pack. And that's what Brett sees the fans as, nothing but a bunch of lousy, stinking hyenas. Brett really liked calling people hyenas in 1997, didn't he? The hitman says the typical American wrestling fan is a disgrace to the rest of the world. Brett was a real hero and he told the truth. For all his years service, he ends up in the ring with a guy trying to rip his leg off and Brett says that's something he didn't deserve. American wrestling fans want to see bones getting broken and they want bloodshed because they belong to a sick society. Brett says he's still the best there is, the best there was and the best there ever will be and when he asks fans if they are sick of hearing the hitman say his famous catchphrase, then the fans should now know how the rest of the world feels when America keeps saying that they're the best. The ambulance that brought Brett to the arena better stay real close because Steve Austin's days, hours and minutes are numbered. Brett says it will be the Hart Foundation dishing out the violence tonight as the promo ends. Brett then says the fans make him sick as Bulldog and Owen wheel Brett to the backstage area. We come back from another commercial and Steve Austin wants to know where the first aid room is, our guy here nearly felt the wrath of the rattlesnake. Back in the ring we had a Legion of Doom vs Furnace and Lafon tag team match and what's interesting here is the backstage promo Furnace and Lafon cut before the bout. They can't understand why the fans haven't got behind them even though they've been extremely competent inside the ring and the tag team argues that if fans got behind them instead of cheering guys like LOD then Furnace and Lafon would have the tag team titles. Furnace says that fans are only getting behind American superstars. You'd definitely think this was leading to Furnace and Lafon maybe getting involved with the Hart Foundation, but nothing comes of it. They do form a Survivor Series team though with a few hearts later in the year. The Road Warriors end up defeating Furnace and Lafon and after the match, Jim Ross gets a quick interview. Furnace repeated what he said earlier, the tag team are facing guys with a home field advantage and Lafon said he wants a rematch against the Road Warriors. As good as these guys were inside the ring, the promo here highlights what the problem was, they weren't the best talkers. Speaking of talkers, Ahmed Johnson cuts a backstage promo where he starts off by apologising for his actions last week. Remember he beat the shit out of the Sultan with a 2x4. Out of nowhere, Ahmed just loses his mind, he catches himself on and he says he's actually not going to apologise, seeing as he has to face three guys at the upcoming In Your House show. The thing is, I don't know what Ahmed's getting so upset about, I mean, wasn't it Ahmed who accepted the challenge? He could have said no and went about his business, but no, Ahmed had to be the big man. Ahmed ends the promo by saying he's a gang member. The question is, what gang does Ahmed Johnson belong to? Let me know in the comments. That's the first 60 minutes of Raw over. We aren't going to do the unopposed point thing cause god knows I got enough flack for that shit in the past but it was a good first hour from the WWF. This is now the Bret Hart and Steve Austin show. Any segment these guys are involved in instantly turns to gold and the WWF are greatly benefiting from Bret's heel turn and Austin's non-stop rise in popularity.
Nitro starts off with footage from Starcade 1993. We see Ric Flair defeating Vader for the WCW Championship. I know they're playing into the whole Flair paving the way thing in the run up to Slamboree, but this is the second time on Nitro that Vader has been shown taking a beating from a current WCW guy. They done this back in 1996 too, when they showed Hulk Hogan vs Vader from Super Brawl 5. With Vader getting so much publicity too over the arrest in Q8, you best believe that this was all done very purposely. Flair and Roddy Piper come out at the start of the show, and Piper says Kevin Nash was complaining about the potholes left behind on the road, but maybe the young guys were just too lazy to fill them in. Piper says he's sick of hearing about the NWO, and he doesn't want to wait until Slamboree. Both he and Flair challenge the NWO to a fight tonight on Monday Nitro. Our opening Nitro match features Prince Ike taking on Dean Malenko, and over on Raw we have an Intercontinental Championship match, Owen Hart vs Rocky Maivia. It's announced that Jeff Jarrett will face Dean Malenko for the US Championship at Slamboree, and Jeff says he'll earn Dean's respect after the match the same way he earned the Horseman's respect. I'm sure you will. After the usual lockups and holds, Malenko and Ike traded arm drags with the Prince getting the upper hand. Ike stays in the driver's seat after dodging a corner lariat and Malenko goes down after a super kick. There's this back body drop right here and I don't know, this just doesn't look right does it? I think there was a bit of miscommunication here but anyway, there must have been another fight in the audience because the fans don't pay attention to the match at all, they miss out on some sweet pin counters. Dean ends up hitting a power slam and he wins with the Texas Cloverleaf, not the best Dean Malenko showcase, you can definitely skip this one. You don't want to skip over the Owen Hart vs Rocky Maivia match though. Davey and Brett watch the match from the entranceway and look at Davey showing off Owen Slammy. What the fuck's he doing here, is he rubbing the Slammy on his arms? Owen gets in the ring and he dedicates this match to big brother Brett. Job guy Maivia makes his entrance, and Owen tries to get in a cheap shot with the IC belt but Maivia dodges it. Rock hits Owen with a clothesline, we see Rocky's arm drag and arm bar that he does in every match during this time period, and Davey gives Brett an education about what Owen should be doing right now, nothing but chin locks. Maivia hits a power slam in the middle of the ring and Brett has to call Davey back. Bulldog wanted to share some key information in regards to successfully winning this battle, but Brett thinks Owen doesn't need any help. Another armbar from Rocky, Owen breaks it up by bringing Maivia to the corner, and we then see an advertisement for the new WWF magazine featuring Bret Hart and Bart Simpson on the cover. There's an article in here about Rocky Maivia and the sophomore Jinx. Rocky Maivia isn't jinxed mate, he's actually blessed to have made it this far, he'll be selling his gear on eBay soon and talking about how Vince McMahon held him back. 3 arm bars from Rocky Maivia, motherfucker. Rocky Maivia arm bar, the people's arm bar. Brett can't watch this nonsense and he turns his head away from the action in the ring. In all seriousness though, this is great. Imagine being a fan with a Steve Austin shirt and Bret Hart is sitting there staring a hole through you, thinking you're nothing more than a lousy stinking hyena. Rocky gets sent out of the ring and Owen hits a baseball slide, the King of Hearts then throws Rock back into the ring and we see a missile dropkick. Owen applies a chin lock and I love how it cuts straight to Davey and Brett, it couldn't be more perfect. Davey even gets a little anxious as Rocky fights out and the bulldog gives us a little dance. The excitement is insane tonight in Omaha. Rock takes a drop to a hold and Owen starts working over the knee. Rocky tries to roll up Owen and he tries a few right hands, but the knee has now became an easy target. Bulldog continues to dance while Brett continues to stare at fans in attendance. Things just aren't looking so good for my via right now. Rock's inexperience comes through again with this little moment right here, it's not great, but he makes up for it with his float over DDT. Rock then hits one of his rougher looking rock bottoms and no one replies with a spinning wheel kick. Bread and Bulldog sense that this one could be coming to an end, they salute Owen as the King of Hearts goes to the top rope, but Owen gets his little rocket smashed on the top turnbuckle, leading to Rocky hitting a back suplex. Rock then goes for a vertical suplex, Owen counters with a pin, 
and Owen Hart wins the match and the Intercontinental Championship for the first time in his career. I remember watching this and thinking there's no way Owen was winning this. It felt like the WWF were hell bent on pushing Rocky through the booze but I went fucking nuts when the King of Hearts won this match. Owen walks back up the rampway and he presents Bret with the belt. The Hart Foundation now holds every belt in the World Wrestling Federation except the WWF Championship cementing their dominance over the entire company. After the match, we see Steve Austin wheeling himself around in a wheelchair. What? Steve Austin gets interviewed next on Raw and we also get a pre-taped Ken Shamrock promo. Six takes on Juventud Guerrera on Nitro. The Cruiserweight title is on the line in the Six vs Guerrera match and gotta say, Six has been having some good matches lately. He sometimes gets brushed off when people talk about the NWO but over these past few weeks he's been having the best matches out of the whole faction. Guerrero starts it off with a head scissors that sends Six out of the ring. Waltman gets taken back a little by Hoovy's aggression and he takes his time getting back inside the ropes. When the action resumes, Guerrera again gets the better of Six with a kick to the jaw. It was all going well until things got a little botchy as you can see right here. Nice. Six brings it to the corner and we see the triple kick combo. Six then hits the Bronco Buster. And when Mark Curtis gets threatened with a Six backhander, our favourite referee doesn't even flinch. Best in the business. Six lands a vertical suplex, a quick leg drop and a forearm from the top rope. He goes back upstairs but he ends up getting his little degenerate smashed on the turnbuckle. And look, we gotta call it as we see it, Hoovy fucks up again, twice. He slips off the top rope and then he thinks Six is gonna roll through on a pin attempt. But give him credit, Guerrero certainly makes up for it with this springboard somersault dropkick. Six ducks out of a lion salt and he applies the buzz killer and Six wins another match on Monday Nitro. No doubt there were some mistakes in this one but they done their best to make up for it, good enough TV match that could have been so much better. Over on Raw, Vince McMahon leaves the ring as Steve Austin sets up his wheelchair inside the ropes. It looks like McMahon won't be conducting this interview. Austin asks the fans at Raw if they want to see a wheelchair match. If Bret Hart can bring himself down to the ring, Stone Cold says he'll fight the hitman wheel for wheel. Austin then takes it back saying he's a lying SOB and he'll just get up from his chair and stump a mud hole in the hitman. Austin thinks this whole Hart Foundation thing is a conspiracy to stop Stone Cold becoming WWF Champion, but on May 11th at In Your House, The Undertaker will see the coldest day in hell because come hell or high water, 4, 5 or 15 hearts, Austin will be at the pay per view and he will become WWF Champion. Bret Hart then appears on the Titantron and he sends a short message to Austin. Brett says Stone Cold will leave Raw tonight in the ambulance that Brett arrived in and Brett's then gonna bust the ambulance up in pieces and that's the bottom line. Austin then leaves to look for the hitman. A hype package for Ken Shamrock then airs on Raw and this includes a very brief interview. Just before it airs though, Vince McMahon confirms that Mike Tyson did not give a response to last week's proposed fight. Jerry Lawler says Shamrock should have challenged George Foreman instead. The promo video airs and Shamrock says he's a challenger. He loves challenging himself and he sees the WWF as his next big challenge. Todd Pettengill provides a voiceover here talking about how the brief glimpses we've seen of Shamrock have been very impressive. And that much was definitely true. The WWF had done a good job of taking their time with Ken Shamrock and only showing us little tidbits of what he could do. Ken says he's afraid of failure. He completely blocks out the word in his mind anytime he steps into the ring and Ken believes he is who he is today because of all the things he went through in his youth and because of the people that support him today. It looks like there's going to be more of this stuff next week too as we look into Ken Shamrock's personal life so yeah, there you go. Vader takes on country singing schmuck Jesse James next while the NWO have a few things to say on Nitro. We also have a Steve Regal vs Chris Benoit match. Hall, Nash and Six take over the commentary desk and Scott Hall says he heard those two dinosaurs Ric Flair and Roddy Piper say that they want a piece of the wolf pack. This was the first time the trio of Hall, Nash and Six were called the wolf pack too, I believe. And Hall says he doesn't care what Piper and Flair say because the people in Norfolk came out tonight to see the new world order. Kevin Nash says there's a little change being made to the Slamboree main event. 
The Wolfpack won 75% of the gate. If Piper and Flair want to go up against the best in the business, they need to realize that it doesn't come cheap. Nash wraps up the promo by saying the NWO misses Hulk Hogan, and that's it. Remember when Benoit and Regal wrestled each other and Regal got busted open so bad that the hard camera had to zoom way out? December 2nd, 1996, episode 60 of Reliving the War. Well, the fucking exact same thing happens again on this week's Nitro, what are the chances? Benoit and Regal just loved beating the hell out of each other, but I'm guessing they also got tore apart backstage due to Turner's standards and practices. They were pretty strict about this kind of stuff over on TNT, and it would have been up to Eric Bischoff to reprimand these guys. Accidents happen, I know, but twice? With the same guys in the same match? In the same spot? Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. It's the headbutts again that caused the bleeding, you can see it right here. Benoit has the match won, he goes for the diving headbutt, but reliving the war legend Kevin Sullivan comes out along with Jacqueline, and Benoit gets attacked. Benoit and Sullivan fight in the ring, it spills to the entranceway where Sullivan gets kicked in the balls, and those who watch Jacqueline's attack afterwards in slow motion might see more than what they bargained for when Jackie's… she… yeah, there's a nip slip. Woman pulls Jackie away from Chris. Ming then comes down and he applies the Tongan death grip on Benoit, and we see a different side of Steve Regal when he checks on Chris Benoit after the beatdown. Chris takes on Ming in a death match at Slamboree. I don't care much about the build up, but I am looking forward to seeing these two in the ring. Hopefully, they beat the hell out of each other for our enjoyment. When you think about it, the WWF might have had a second chance here with Vader. With the Kuwait stuff and how he defended the honour of pro wrestling, that was an opportunity to do something more with the big man, and to their credit, they do try to capitalise. Vader completely wrecks Jesse James, the real Double J didn't have a hope in hell, and Jim Ross, who was getting pretty hot at the announce desk and calling Vader a bully, decides to interview the big man after the bout. Ross wants to know if Vader feels any shame or remorse about what happened in Kuwait, and Vader said he just done his job while overseas, that job being beating people up. Vader apologises for nothing and he apologises to no one. JR reminds fans that the Kuwaiti TV host said wrestling was fake and JR wants to know if Vader overreacted while on the show. Vader says he'll happily finish his Q80 interview right now in the ring if JR wants to continue asking questions. Vader removes JR's hat and the big man says he isn't here to be insulted and he isn't here to be made a fool of. Vader grabs Jim by the throat and JR ends up getting saved by Ken Shamrock. We see a belly to belly suplex and Vader decides to leave the ring. Shamrock grabs a mic and he says it won't be Vader time at in your house, it'll be hard time. Triple H vs Goldust on Raw, Lex Luger and the Giant vs the Amazing French Canadians on Nitro. No, not the Quebecers, the Amazing French Canadians. Before the Nitro match, we get a pre-taped Randy Savage promo paid for by the New World Order, and Savage tells DDP that Kimberly has her eyes on the Macho Man because Kimberly has class with a capital K. Savage didn't know Dallas's name before, but he knows it now. Paige has stepped into the world of Macho Madness, and it's just stuff like this that doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't further the Paige rivalry, and we don't learn anything new. Still, it's the Macho Man doing what the Macho Man does best, so it's still good. Tony Schiavone reminds us that Nitro will be a one hour broadcast for the next few weeks as Luger and Cardwellette start the match off, and the French Canadians end up dropping Luger over the top rope and those tight WCW ropes made this one look pretty painful. The double teaming continues inside the ring and it makes you wonder why the giant isn't stepping in to help out his partner. Willette misses an elbow drop and then the giant gets tagged in, it's awful nice of him. Giant chokeslams Rougeau, Luger wrecks Willette, it's over before it even gets started and the crowd still go fucking insane for Lex Luger. Lex still has that title shot in his back pocket and it doesn't take too long before we see that come into play. If you think these reactions are good, just wait until Luger faces Hulk Hogan. Lex Luger takes a lot of flack these days, but I can't think of a single wrestler today who gets comparable reactions to 1997 Lex Luger on a consistent weekly basis. Over like Rover. On Raw, the mere thought of sitting through another Goldust vs Triple H match is enough to make me want to quit this series, so I'll keep it brief. 
Goldust told Marlena to stay in the back for this one. Where Goldust is going tonight is no place for a lady. And yes, we do see a more aggressive Goldust in this match, but we have been seeing this same more aggressive Goldust for months now, and it's just boring at this point. I really miss the 1996 Goldust. China's the only interesting thing about this rivalry, but there's only so many times she can throw Marlena around before that too gets played out. The tables were turned this time though, Marlena does end up making an appearance, of course, and when China tries to attack, Marlena throws powder that blinds China. Helmsley went to check on his bodyguard, but the ninth wonder of the world began choking the King of Kings, and well, it was absolute shit. Goldust wins via countout. This rivalry needs to end, but guess what? They have another match on Raw next month. Steve Mongo McMichael finds himself in a world of trouble when he faces the Barbarian next on Nitro, while The Undertaker cuts a promo on Raw's war. Let's quickly look at The Undertaker's promo. Vince McMahon asks The Undertaker if he has any remorse for what he did to Paul Bear at the previous In Your House show, and The Undertaker says no man deserves to have the flesh burnt from his face, but there is an old saying, the one who covets the flame ends up getting burnt. I'm not sure if- is that a, is that a saying? I, I don't know. Vince wants to know how Taker feels about the number one contender, Stone Cold Steve Austin. And the Phenom understands that Austin has quite a lot of momentum heading into a cold day in hell, but if Austin comes at Undertaker while distracted, Stone Cold will end up leaving in your house in- I mean, Stone Cold will leave the match in a wheelchair in worse shape than what he was in- I'm sorry, Stone Cold will- Actually, let me directly quote The Undertaker. If you come in distracted, you may leave in far worse shape than what a wheelchair will take you. Son, you may just rest in peace. Okay, over on Nitro, there's no way in this world that Steve McMichael can beat the Barbarian. It just can't happen. <sighs> we get reminded about the Reggie White vs Mongo match coming up at Slamboree as Steve makes his way down to the ring. And right off the bat, the Barbarian isn't going to make this easy on our big horseman friend. A few hard shots knock Steve loopy for a second, McMichael replies with a clothesline and Steve pulls off a back body drop. I like Mongo's little jump during the move. Mongo then whips Barbarian to the corner and instead of following up, he starts talking shit to the audience. This prompts the Barbarian to kick McMichael's head off and Big Steve gets thrown out of the ring, taking a very Mongo-esque bump while doing so. Mongo gets whipped so hard into the guardrail that he pisses himself and our main man gets his back rammed into the ring post. Back inside the ropes, the Barbarian hits Steve with a pile driver and keep an eye on Mark Curtis. He's just like... Oh wow, pile driver on Mongo, I don't care. Steve tries to fight back but a poke in the eye stuns the horseman. Barbarian goes to work in the corner but Curtis steps in to stop the destruction of Mongo. Barbarian gets distracted, Deborah passes the briefcase. Barbarian gets clobbered and what do you know, Steve Mongo McMichael beats the Barbarian on Nitro. If we have got one saving grace here, it's the fact that there's no horseman promo that follows the match and there's no Jeff Jarrett either. Double J's out taking care of Horseman business and getting his theme remix changed for Nitro next week. But man, Mongo McMichael beats the Barbarian in the Nitro main event nonetheless. Dark days. Dark, dark days. Alright, we end this week's Reliving the War with a match on Raw, The Undertaker vs The British Bulldog. On Nitro, we're gonna see if the NWO answer Piper and Flair's challenge. Bulldog has been shouting and dancing all night and I was actually looking forward to seeing Davy Boy take on the dead man, but there's interference pretty early in the match and it's hard to even call this a main event bout. Brian Pillman prays for a British Bulldog victory before the match and he prays so hard that his nose starts dripping. Not even joking, have you ever prayed so much that snot flew out of your nose? Bulldog dedicates this title match to Brett just like Owen did earlier and Bulldog promises to become WWF Champion. If Davey can do it, if our fucking guy can do it tonight on Raw, then the hearts hold all the gold. Davey gets off to a bad start when Taker lifts him up by the throat and Davey gets slammed to the mat. We then go to commercial break and the moment we come back, Bulldog hits a vertical suplex. The Undertaker then hits the choke slam, he signals for the tombstone, 
But Owen Hart runs in, and the match ends in a disqualification. It doesn't even get started. Steve Austin ends up showing up and he chases away the Hart Foundation, but when Stone Cold celebrates with the WWF Championship, The Undertaker decides to square up to the Rattlesnake. Austin throws the belt down and he hits the Phenom with a Stone Cold Stunner, and when Austin decides to flip The Undertaker off, the WWF Champion wakes up and Austin takes a choke slam. Stone Cold rolls out of the ring and he now has a choice. Brett is all alone at the entranceway, The Undertaker is in the ring, and Stone Cold decides he's gonna tell Taker he'll see him at the pay per view before making his way over to the Hitman. Brett gets up from his wheelchair, he needs to somehow defend himself here, but Brett had a plan all along. Jim the Anvil Nightheart returns to the WWF and he attacks Steve Austin from behind. Brett then takes a shot at Austin, Stone Cold gets whacked with a crutch, and Austin falls off the stage, resulting in Stone Cold getting taken away in an ambulance just as Bret Hart predicted earlier in the show. Jim and Brett leave the arena, and Raw ends with this really creepy image of Brian Pillman smiling at the camera. This always stuck out to me, it's something I always remembered and I really don't know why. Pillman does look freaky here though, so good job. On Nitro, Piper and Flair are all fired up. Flair says the Nature Boy and the Hot Rod want the NWO right now, and Flair then says he doesn't know if he can take on Hall and Nash, but six is easy. The Nature Boy says he's won more world titles than Sean Waltman has had pieces of ass, and this was a great line for sure, a line that apparently got Flair into trouble backstage. Again, standards and practices, but sometimes you gotta take a risk and this one paid off. Flair again tells the NWO to get in the ring seeing as they drew the house tonight, but NWO propaganda falls from the ceiling instead. The paper says tradition bites NWO for life. And you'd think this is how Nitro's gonna end, but we do get an appearance from the original Wolfpack. Hall, Nash and Six make their way down to the ring, and Waltman is eager to get his hands on Flair. Six breaks away and he makes a dash for the nature boy and a fight breaks out on the entranceway. Flair takes care of all three NWO members, but that doesn't last too long. The Nature Boy ends up getting destroyed by Hall, Nash and Six, and he screams for Piper to help him. Piper, for whatever reason, stands in the ring doing absolutely fuck all. Just before Nitro goes off the air, the Hot Rod rushes out of the ring to attack Nash, but the show then quickly fades to black. It's a very strange end to WCW Nitro this week where it felt like the team struggled to readjust to a 60 minute format. Raw wins this week's episode of Reliving the War. Something you may have noticed is that the WWF are doing well in telling long stories through multiple segments on Raw, and this has worked in their favour so far. Like everything though, this would soon feel like standard procedure, and it becomes nothing special, but as complete shows, the WWF are doing very well in providing weekly entertainment that feels more episodic, if that makes sense. Raw doesn't feel like a ton of senseless matches anymore when you compare to 1995 and 1996. WCW Nitro doesn't feel as organised, but we should give them a pass this week too. Going back to 60 minutes definitely affected the overall quality of their broadcast. Raw now has 33 points, Nitro has 37, and we've had 11 ties. In the TV ratings, Nitro scored a 3.4 and Raw managed a 2.7. Thanks for putting up with this one guys, I know I sound like shit but I wanted to get this out. I don't want to say that the next episode will definitely be available on time because I honestly don't know. I've been fucked about quite a bit with this house move but like the last few weeks, if Reliving the War doesn't get uploaded next Thursday, you know the reason why. I've pretty much ran out of content to put on the channel, everything that you've seen over these past few weeks, with the exception of Reliving the War, was stuff that I already had made and uploaded to the channel beforehand. I'm trying my best to keep things coming out, but probably by the time you're watching this video, the home move situation will have changed again. Reliving the War takes priority though, as soon as I get set back up and I'm back on my proper PC, episode 82 will get scripted, because never again am I using this laptop to put together an episode, it was horrific. But thanks for watching guys and thanks for sticking with it. 
I hate not being able to provide solid information, but rest assured I'll do everything I can to keep the series coming out in good time. I'll see you all again real soon and take care of yourselves.